Hello, everybody. As all copywriters know, a confession is always a good way to start. So here my confession is written on a digital medium. As a kid, I've spent most of my summertime in the countryside at my grandparents' place, running in the fields. And I used to play in my grandpa's harvest field while he was growing greens and grapes to make excellent Italian wine. Well, it's been during one of these happy times that I had one of my most significant philosophical meetings when I met my very first artichoke. An artichoke, yes. And now I'm going to ask you, in your opinion, what's been my very first thought as I came across the artichoke? Was it a, a concept, an idea? No, it's been, ouch. Not a thought, it's been just a feeling. It hurts my soft little hands of a kid because it's got thorns, as you see. So the artichoke was a simple, a mere presence to my senses, an immediate presence. Whereas a true thought is something mediate, is the result of a process of intellectual work. So Hegel, the German philosopher, would say that even at its worst, fairest appearance, a thought is already a process. Trying to fake the German accent, sorry. Hume, the Scottish philosopher, would say it's a result of our sensation being conceived by our mind. So it must access our mind to become a thought. Well, our mind is not comfortable with thorns. Our senses are. That's why they are so quick and good at converting thorns into pain an immediate, unprocessed piece of information, not a thought, not yet. To get an idea out of the artichoke, first I had to discover a few technologies to handle it. Gloves to protect my hands, then a knife to cut it open and take the thorns away, and fire, of course, to cook it. So after I augmented myself by these technologies, I could make an idea out of the artichoke. So I could think about the intelligence of nature, which is able to protect itself. I could make it a metaphor of a soft, hidden heart to express a some rough yet tender human character. And of course, I could invent some recipes to enjoy it at dinner with friends and family. By the way, in Italian language, knowledge and taste share the same etymology, the Latin sapere, means both to add flavor and to add meaning. So I could even make it a creative idea to advertise a delicious antidote against life's stressful modernity. No, and no, here it is. It's not mine, of course, because it's from the very old times of Italian Bevete anche voi Cinar e bevetelo così, 40 grammi di Cinar, una buccia di arancia o di limone e una spruzzata di felt ben ghiacciato. Ecco il vostro Cinar contro il logorio della vita moderna. Ok, so, from this confession comes the first law of Guglielmoni, which is me. And this law is, I mean, the laws of food for geek thought, which is without technology, the mind is in pose mode. So, you may not trust me, but I'm pretty sure you, are trust, you, are, you will trust Gary Larson, the comic drawer. So, if you see this uh, strip, this uh, vignette, you will see that no technology means no food. So, the skewer is the technology allowing humans to eat their food. Otherwise, there is only pain and stink of human burnt flesh. Only sensation, no idea. So the skewer is the technology to make raw meat into food for thought, just like I made the artichoke into food for geek thought when I was a kid. So from this comes the first axiom of Guglielmoni, which is the foundation of the first law of Guglielmoni, 
which is human mind, is wired for technological interfaces. So, in brief, our thoughts wouldn't be there without interfaces. I'm not saying it, Nietzsche is. So, if you disagree, talk to him, if you can revive him from the dead, of course. Jokes aside, Nietzsche had a point that we have such a divine thinking machine embedded in our organism, yet this divine thinking machine is the mark of our weakness. Because our mind is what compelled us human beings to find tech interfaces to live long and prosper. Think about it. We don't have fangs, we don't have two stomachs, and we don't have clothes. So, we're not very good predators, but we are very good thinkers. This is why, eventually, we became the best predators in the world on top of the food chain. So, nature didn't provide us with tools to achieve our goals. We had to design them by ourselves. That's our nature. So, our nature is to invent ourselves by inventing technologies that augment us. So we human beings are like our human mind, not something immediate, but the result of a process. So we human beings are the only creatures in all creation to work in two worlds. We are both inside and outside nature. So our mind is capable of thinking tools to achieve our goals, but these goals, we only discover them while we are interacting with those very same tools. So our tools guide us to goals that we weren't even aware of. Therefore, they influence our evolution, our ideas, and our behaviors. So technologies are somehow interfaces to connect us to ourselves. I mean, I guess this is a concept you may be familiar with, because you have certainly heard of George Bazala or Kevin Kelly, okay? But this is what I mean. Human life belongs in this virtual circle between thought, technology, and behavior. And now, a couple of examples. When Nike teamed up with Apple, they called on RGA to help them create the Nike Plus digital experience. A sensor in your shoe tracks your running data and transmits it to your iPod. Beginning workout, you've gone 45 miles. Your average pace is 7-Eleven per mile. Workout completed. And when you get home and sync your iPod, NikePlus.com is where it all comes together. Your runs in the real world become meaningful assets in the digital world. You can compare runs, track your progress, set and manage goals, and issue individual or team challenges to other Nike Plus runners around the world. In less than a year, Nike Plus runners have run an astounding 10 million miles. Today, people of all ages, of every shape, size, and ability, are now Nike Plus runners. Nike Plus is reinventing running as a fun, social, digitally enhanced sport. Countless runners new to the brand have discovered okay, superior so performance. Behavior. People listen to the iPod while they run. Technology. The pace sensor. The thought to connect the iPod and the sensor. And a new behavior is born people begin to challenge each other, and the, vir the virtual circle goes on, okay? We have another example, the cell phone. So if you're familiar with the first movie, the first Wall Street movie, when we saw this brick used like, an, uh, like a cell phone, we used to think that the revolution brought by the cell phone was about voice, and we were wrong, because cell phones knew that it was going to be about text messaging. Twitter, for example. So my point is that there is a dialectics going on between thought and technology, and uh, these dialectics empower thought itself. Nevertheless, many philosophers despise technology. So why? Because they see technology as opposed to pure being. And I mean, this is a, a, an antagonism starting from Parmenides, from the ancient Greek philosophy, and his juxtaposition of what becomes and what is. Well, they forget the learning of the artichoke, of course, and the first law of Guglielmoni, which is without technology, the mind is in pose mode. 
Because to afford becoming philosopher, first, we had to develop a few technology. Otherwise, we would be still struggling for survival against bigger predators than ourselves, let alone thinking of pure being, of course. So the technology we invented allowed us to become more than what we were. Technology allowed the existence of philosophy itself. There is a crucial technology without which we'd still live in the age of myths, which we'd share around the fireplace, face to face with our voice. Writing. This is the technology. Writing is a tool, is an expression of a design to achieve a certain purpose. Writing is a technology to give human thought physical existence. An external hard drive. I mean, stone tablets were definitely hard. A hard drive to share thoughts and make them last beyond the flatus voces. So Rilke, the poet, wrote in the sonnets to Orpheus, only the everlasting gives consecration. And Spengler, the German philosopher, wrote, technology is tactics of life itself. So writing is so powerful a technology for human thought that Plato, the Greek philosopher, was not totally comfortable with it to be the place for all his philosophy. So he wrote dialogues as a written replica of an unwritten medium. And he didn't write his most precious teachings, which we call Plato unwritten philosophy. So Plato belonged to a world which was still swimming in oral transmission. He lived in between two ages, the oral one and the written one. Just like us, we live in between the analog culture and the digital culture. To us, it feels weird to think of a culture without writings, without books, not to Plato. Next generations will feel the same regarding our world. They will evolve into a new philosophical mindset, provided that we learn the artichoke lesson, of course. This lesson is what makes our intellect move from passive to active. In Aristotle's philosophy, the disciple of Plato, intellect was put into action by an external agent. In Middle, Age, in, uh, sorry, in Middle Ages Christian philosophy, this external agent was supposed to be an angel or God himself. So the bottom line is our intellect needs an external interface to be activated. According to the interface it is wired to, our intellect, our minds, evolves in a way or another. Let's consider Protestantism. The Protestant reform begins with Martin Luther. He, amongst other things, suggested the individual interpretation of the Bible. Now tell me, do you think this vision would have been possible without Gutenberg printing? I think not. What was the first book printed with this revolutionary technology? The Bible, of course. So, where does many philosophers' distrust of technology come from? Well, from this. This is the cinematic representation, of course, of the second industrial revolution, the steam machine, a machine capable of moving by itself. So, John Carpenter's Christine represents the philosopher's nightmare to face something similar to us, movement, but not similar to us, it's not flesh and blood. Something able to take our place in the order of things. Because our mind is weak and fearful. This is Nietzsche's lessons again. So still, there is a dialectics between human thought and technology. And let's consider futurism. Futurism is art trying to think like a machine, imitating its power and its speed. Of course, it, this is art, not philosophy. So it's legitimate that this is just an imitation, not a, cons not a dialectics, a philosophical dialectics. But have you seen our Italian students' dissertation? I mean, they are Wikipedia cut and paste. So imitation is the highest form of flattery, of course, but not of philosophy. So here my question is, why the, dialects the, di sorry, the dialectics between human thought and technology that was so working well in the past has now narrowed down to mere imitation? Well, this is the aim of my project for a philosophy of technology to bring natural dialectics between human thought and technology to a level of theoretical digital consciousness. Otherwise, 
we, at our best, will only be able to imitate what our technologies can do better than we do. So only if we learn how to develop technology thinking, just as Plato and Luther and Futurism did, our human thought can talk peer-to-peer -peer with technology and finally learn the lesson of the artichoke, which is how to make any technology into food for geek thought and eventually to find an antidote to modern stressful life, which is the antidote to modern stressful life, the payoff of that Italian liqueur made with artichokes. Cheers.